Hello again and welcome to the final Backyard Farmer of the season. I'm Kim Todd. It really is hard to believe our last show is here. We're still going to answer those questions for the next hour. As our television season comes to an end, do keep in mind you can always watch those past shows and those features on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Facebook. So starting with samples, Jody, you have a war going on or what here? Well, I'm trying. I don't know if they'll fight, but I don't want to risk it. And if it's going to happen somewhere, it's going to be on live TV, right? So I have two praying mantises or praying mantids. You cannot call them manti, I guess. But these are both the Carolina mantis and uh, they're our native mantid. And they're actually both the same species. And so I'm here, I, I wanted to bring both to show that it really doesn't have anything to do with color. But these are the smaller of the mantids that we see in Nebraska. And these are both female. And you can tell because their wings do not extend the whole length of their abdomen. And uh, they are pretty, I, I don't know what's a nice word. They're kind of uh, robust down here because they're probably going to lay some egg cases or uuthika. They often lay this on buildings or structures, items. If you leave like planters outside or tools that you may see a little egg case and those kind of look like little bricks, but that's how they overwinter as eggs. And then little mantids, hundreds of them will come out next spring. So if you see these uh, on flowering fall plants, they are probably eating the flies and the bees and the wasps out there. And um, they probably aren't gonna live too much longer. So go out and enjoy them. And the males, I can't catch the males. They have longer wings, they have slender bodies and they fly readily. So that's why I've got two females here today. Love it. We usually have an egg casing on the window in our courtyard up about 20 feet. Hmm. And yeah, for heaven's I think, sakes, what a place to lay your eggs. Yeah, I think after you do garden cleanup, it's safer yeah. for them. They survive better to, to not have their eggs in, in the garden. There you go. Ooh. All right. Rock, looks like a bad bird's nest. Or a bad hair day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have two weeds here, both of them summer annuals. We have crabgrass that started to go dormant or die. Um, that's actually the back end, sorry about that. Um, you know, it went, we had our frost last week. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, that's the typical crabgrass seed head. And then we have um, prostrate spurge. So I'm gonna take these, because I'm gonna try to make a point here. And I'm gonna shake them over this piece of paper. And I'm gonna show how many weed seeds fell off of that. Look at that, there's some debris in there, but there's probably a couple hundred spurge seeds and um, you know, maybe one to 150 and somewhere in that range of crabgrass seeds right there. So why am I showing into this? Well, the, when you're cleaning up now, right, you're gonna be grabbing these things and you know, they're gonna come up readily. That dense mat of the spurge is not gonna be a problem to pull because the roots have essentially died off and the plant's done and you think, yeah, it's a perfect time to clean up. And I'm not suggesting you like carefully put something underneath them, but when you're picking those up, get it into a receptacle immediately. Mm -hmm. and so that those seeds aren't spread because you're just gonna continue to propagate the problem. You had, you know, there were four or five spurge plants in here and a couple of crabgrass plants, and now you have this, which is this, you know, three to 500 seeds. So get it put in a receptacle. You know, when you weed, have a bucket with you immediately. People like to rake this up. You realize that when you're raking it, surely it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more efficient way to do it, but you're just spreading that seed when you do that. Um, if it's in an ornamental bed and it doesn't have a very good mulch layer, you can control it next year with a good healthy dose, two to three inches of organic mulch. On top of that, make sure you don't put it over to the base of woody species and it'll do amazing. Your landscape ornamentals will rise up through that mulch bed with no problem. Um, so you don't even need to use a herbicide, but if in, in the lawn, you're probably, in, and you're picking these up, you're gonna be spreading seed when you do it. It would have been better to try to control them in some other ways, or at the end of the day, have a healthier turf stand so that they never have a chance to establish. But I'm always amazed this time of year, how many weed seeds you can pull off in, in the palm of your hand just by pushing on one um, crabgrass seedling, it's, it's, or seed head, it's crazy. All right, excellent. Jeff, great seeds and not so good for foliage, right? Yeah, right. Well, you know, so this is Eastern Wahoo. So it's our native Uwanamas. You really find it in the southeast part of the state. 
Uh, if you're kind of climbing along the bluffs in the southeast part of the state, you might see it in there or see the, as it goes into fall color and see the fruit. So it's one of those things that you'll, you'll notice when you are, are out hiking down there. Uh, so I brought it for a couple of reasons. One, to show that you know we do have something that has some nice uh, ornamental fruit, something during the fall. It also will start turning into a pinkish red color. It's, it's not as brilliant as maybe uh, the typical burning bush, but it still it, it adds some color to the to the late fall landscape, which is nice. The other reason I brought it is this is kind of my indicator plant at home. Mm -hmm. because it has very fibrous root system, like a lot of our shrubs do, hydrangea, spirea, uh, lilacs, uh, your euonymus. Um, and because of our really dry conditions statewide right now, um, these are plants that we're gonna wanna get on a watering schedule now. If you haven't already started, um, you need to start checking these things. And if you have a, a sprinkler system at your home or you've been running hoses around, you may think you've been catching it. But this is when you want to get in there, like Rock was talking about, if you have a nice mulch layer, pull the mulch back and make sure that the soil is moist. Use that screwdriver to go in there and make sure that you have some good moisture. If not, get it on a schedule now until the ground freezes. For pretty much every plant right yeah, now all right, over the state, it's right. really getting Including higher. turf. Including turf, right. Some of the turf is really going a little dormant. When you can put your hand in the crack, it's a little dry. A little dry, exactly. That's on Jeff's lawn. <laughs> it is <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jody, you get the first round of um, questions and pictures. Um, the first one here, all he says is found behind the front door. What is it? And of course, we got several of these this week. Yeah. And I was looking for one all day and I could not find this. This is a wolf spider. This is the tiger wolf spider. Uh, if anyone ever gets close enough to it, you can actually see little patches of orange in some of the colors on the legs. But you'll also see um, an orange or light stripe that goes between the eyes. And um, that indicates a, a tiger wolf spider. But beside that dime, it looks huge. But some of them are, are very large. And good guys. Depends who you are. I, I, I think they're okay outside. I probably would uh, just do your best to keep them outside. They <laughs> let them live, but let them live outside. Just make sure you turn your lights off at night, and uh, you know, make sure you've got seals under your door so they don't get in. Yeah, they're not coming into my house either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your next one is fun. This is uh, a family and the, the kids also watch the show. They found this a couple of weeks ago. Insect dragging the spider. The spider was dead. Insect dragged it. So it was moving toward a mulch bed. So they want to know what kind of spider, what kind of insect is the, in, did the insect kill the spider? What, what happened so here? So this is really cool. And I, I'm, I'm glad that there's a, a family that other than mine that watches the show <laughs> and that you got to see this. I have not seen this happen, but this is a, what is this one called? A rusty spider wasp. So it's a family of wasps that uh, if they, what's it called? Parasitize. They, well, they provision their nest. So mm. wasps need to feed their larvae other insects or arthropods. And this family does this with wolf spiders. So that's the solution to one of the wolf spiders. Um, so what it did was it stung it to paralyze it and then it's dragging it, which you could see it's much bigger than the wasp, it's dragging it to that hole. So if you actually got to see it go to the mulch, that's where it's little, I guess where it's gonna put it, a little, you know, maybe, I don't know how many, maybe an inch or so under the soil, lay an egg on it and its larvae and a new wasp will emerge. So it, it probably isn't gonna recover. But that's really cool. That is really cool, that's mm -hmm. fun. And then your next one is really cool too. We got this from two different people. Uh, one was uh, acreage near Malcolm and the other one uh, is in Kearney who sent a similar picture. What is this? Yeah, and so this is also produced from a spider. This is an egg sac from the uh, black and yellow garden spiders. So those really cool ones that have those big orb webs in the garden. Um, so you may be seeing this. Some of the female spiders can you know, produce up to three of these, but it's going to stay this way and overwinter. So they usually will keep it somewhere that's protected. So that is going to be a black and yellow garden spider next spring. Well, you'll see maybe a couple little tiny ones, hundreds of them if you see them, but they will disperse on the wind and you will, if you're lucky, you'll see one next summer. That's, that's pretty neat. All right, Rock. Your first three are actually pictures of what she's calling a turf grass invasion. This is in Donovan. 
uh, very large, well-established bluegrass lawn, surrounded by crops, etc. She thinks this is fescue in the bluegrass, starts as small circles, then grow darker than the bluegrass. She wants to know if that's really what's going on. Can they spray the circles and then overseed with bluegrass? And if so, when should they do this? So I, when I look at this, I, I, I think it might be brome because they live in the country. It doesn't really look like fescue to me, primarily because our bluegrasses, most of our contemporary bluegrasses tend to be um, more emerald color and then the fescues tend to be a little lighter and this is the exact opposite of that, but the brome, smooth brome or, but regardless, if it's smooth brome or fescue, you know, without a really close picture, we can't adequately determine, but actually thank, thanks for bring, sending in three pictures, that really helped. But it looks like a single plant established and then it started to spread. And once again, fescue doesn't really spread that readily, but the, um, but the brome does have rhizomes and it can. So you certainly can spray these out. Um, understand that because it is, has a spreading nature, you probably wanna go 10 to 20% around the perimeter of that with something like glyphosate. Um, and you may wanna do it multiple times because these are perennials that are uh, relatively tolerant you know, of a single application and it may, may need two or three. I believe she mentioned something about sodding over that mm -hmm. and that's certainly a possibility, but our biggest issue is this, if we go, we could go back in with a bluegrass, a more, a newer variety or a sod that doesn't match and then you could have the same look mm -hmm. again because it could be darker green. If this was one, one of the older bluegrasses, maybe it did have that lighter green color. So my concern is, is that I'm not sure, really sure she can readily control this. If she's upset because it's spreading, she doesn't like the coarseness of it, certainly spray it out. But at the same time, I'm not convinced you wanna spend a lot of time um, throwing in new bluegrass, hoping that the bluegrass is the same color because there is really no way to tell until you plant the seed and see it grow. Unless I, she knows what that seed mix unless was. She, yeah, exactly. Right. If she knows what the yeah. seed mix was or she bought it from a sod farm and they still have it. But these things rotate off of every five to seven years. So if that lawn is older than 10 or 15 years or 10 years, finding a match is gonna be difficult. Um, I, wish I, I wish I had better news for you, but if you don't like the course and love it, certainly spray it out and then put some bluegrass back into it. But they may end up with a similar problem only with the same grass. All right, and then your next one is a Lincoln viewer. Says, cannot get rid of this weed in the turf. What is it and how do we kill this one? So I, I, I would ask a view, in the, all of our viewers, if you can get a, um, a closer picture, primarily of where the leaf comes into the stem, there are a couple structures there that make identification relatively easy. I looked at this, for a while before we started. And I, it may be smooth crabgrass, which is, you know, we have some of it in the state, most of the time we, we have large crabgrass. It may be smooth crabgrass, but if they're having difficulty controlling it, I'm concerned that it may be a perennial grass that I'm not able to identify with what we've got in front of us. So, um, you know, once again, with the end of the year, there's no way we can get a closer picture of it, but that would have been helpful. If it was crabgrass, then obviously into the crabgrass preventers, um, and it did have a look very much like, um, smooth crabgrass, so any of the, any of the um, pre-emergent herbicides will work on it. It's just that we don't have a lot of it in, the, in Nebraska, eastern Nebraska. All right, thanks, Rock. Uh, Jeff, your first two are actually pictures from a Northwest Iowa Storm Lake viewer, but sure. we could have gotten 10 from Lincoln and Omaha as well. Sure. These are large lilacs, maybe 40 years old. A uh, younger one is 10. Notice leaves turning brown and dropping, which we've talked about mm -hmm. with Kyle. They do have drought, uh, did very well. Then all of a sudden we have new leaves and we have lilacs flowering. Yeah. So, and then we had another one from Plymouth County, Iowa, doing the same thing. And as I said, Lincoln and Omaha, all over the state. What's mm -hmm. going on with the lilacs? Well, I think there's, you know, it's not unusual to see a lot of different plants do kind of a secondary flower. Crab apples will do a mm -hmm. smattering of that. Uh, magnolias sometimes is, can be considerable. I gotta wonder, Fred, or Fred, um, Rock mentioned, um, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Rock mentioned the cold weather. And I wonder that having that good cold weather, things warmed up, we had some moisture, kind of opened those buds up, triggered some things. So those dormant buds, um, went ahead and, and put on the flowers. So I think there's probably that that we're looking at. But I think the other thing to think about is just what I was talking about earlier is making sure that we're uh, giving some supplemental water to some of these older mature plants that you don't even worry about. You don't even think about it because it's been there for 40 years mm -hmm. and you don't do anything to it and it does fight every year. Right. So um, 
you know, and also this is a good time to just take a look and see if we're having some bore damage on some of those stems. I don't know if I'd worry about taking them out now, but early in, uh, you know, late winter, early spring, you could do some of that work at that time. All right. Great answer, Bob. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Your next one is an Omaha viewer, Jeff. Seven foot tall white pine in the backyard. Started growing at an angle due to shade. Moved it to a sunnier spot, but he's still got a little yeah. angle. He's wondering, can it be straightened up? Well, they could certainly try. I think if they've gone to that much trouble to save the tree, I think I'd give it an effort. And, and there's one of the lateral branches that's kind of wrapping around the stem. I would go ahead and carefully remove that. Mm -hmm. um, but you can go to your garden center. They'll have large bamboo canes. And I think I would take one of those and some twine or some, they'll have some horticulture tape and gently see if we can straighten that out a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, you may not get that to be totally vertical, but you should be able to get it. And over time, you know, in 25 years, you'll never notice it. So. <laughs> and your next one is actually a Montgomery spruce, which is the low shrub form. Mm -hmm. Seven years ago, planted. Uh, he, they're wondering, should they take some of the lower branches off? I, you know, it's a spectacular spruce. I yes. think that. I mean, I wish I had four of those in my yard. Yes. So I think it's just beautiful. If, if there, some of those branches are getting maybe into the railing or the walkway. If that's what they're worried about, they could, you know, head some of those back. But I don't know. I don't see anything wrong with it. So if you need to do some pruning for shape or to get it out of the way, do that. But otherwise, congratulations. <laughs> exactly. And you're envious. Yeah, I am. <laughs> well, a few weeks ago, Elizabeth gave us some tips for cutting back or not cutting back our ornamental grasses. There are also a lot of other ornamentals and shrubs that need our attention this time of year. So we headed out to the backyard farmer garden with our pruning shears to talk about what we should prune. year we always get the questions about what should I cut back, what should I clean up, and what should I do with it. In a previous segment we talked about doing that with ornamental grasses, so let's take a look at perennials and a handful of shrubs. First off, if it is a plant that wants to seed itself all over creation, you have to decide how much of that you really enjoy. Take this one for example, which is hardy ageratum. This one was not planted here, it wasn't planted down there, it belongs up there and it's just beginning to set seed. This is not really a plant that gives us good habitat over the winter, so at least deadheading or cutting back is a good idea. If you have plants that have flopped over dreadfully or fallen apart either because you didn't cage them or because you have a creature, that's another reason to go ahead and cut them back. You also then have to make the balance or take a balance between providing that pollinator habitat or habitat for birds or seeds or those kinds of things against winter interest and the beauty that you can really have provided with all those seed heads in a perennial garden. Our liatris has actually seeded itself all over the place in our rain chain in only four years, but that's a good thing. The pollinators love it. It is beautiful when it's in flower. And yet we also can have too much of a good thing. So we are likely to cut back some of these large seed heads before they spread even further, allowing a handful of them to stand for the winter interest. Penstemon is also a plant that we look at and do some cutting back on. Penstemon is considered a, a short-lived perennial, so you really do need to let those penstemon seed themselves about a bit. Shell leaf penstemon is one example. We have dark towers, which is a hybrid. We have some Husker Red, which may or may not come true from seed. One of the mistakes that people make in cutting back penstemon is they will just take the seed head off, not take that stalk all the way down to the base. So go ahead and cut that all the way down to where you see the rosette of foliage. It tidies it up and cleans it up better. Fall is not the time to prune trees and shrubs, especially right now with the drought, with everything else going on. And that includes shrub roses. We get a lot of questions about, can I cut my shrub roses back now? You really don't want to do that. They are shrubs. If you need to take them down a little bit further, only take them down to about 18 inches and make sure that crown is protected. We have a lot of shrubs that also tend to look a little ratty this time of year. Don't do that pruning either because what you're really doing is stimulating those shrubs to put on new growth when in fact what they're supposed to be doing is shutting down for the winter. 
So don't be too quick to take out those pruning shears and just take everything down to scorched earth. We want the habitat, we want the winter interests, we want the fruit, we want to be able to attract the birds, keep those insects happy over the winter months, and enjoy the beauty and not cause harm to those plants. Do take a good look around your landscape and understand what needs cutting back and which ones to leave for spring before you make that pruning cut instead of after. That's a bad idea. All right, Jody, next round of questions and pictures. The first is a viewer who sent a large bumblebee. He said at least two inches long, bigger than a 50 cent piece. Uh, what is that one? And it, he said he got real close and it, it didn't really care. And this is Omaha. Yeah, I'm known to go around petting bumblebees, so they're, they're pretty busy. But this bumblebee looks perfect. And you know why? Because this is a new queen. So oh. this is probably one that has just emerged and she's feeding and then she's gonna go find a protected place to overwinter. And then next year she'll come out of wherever this protective place is and start her own nest. So um, yeah. She is probably, she is the common bumblebee. So there's over 20, I think there's 20 species of bumblebees in Nebraska. I am terrible at identifying bumblebees, but um, there is a Nebraska bumblebee atlas that you can mm -hmm. look up. There's a lot of good resources and you can teach me all about bumblebees, but so the common bumblebee and a queen. Very nice. So your next one is Gothenburg and wonders what this is and it's on a Gerbera daisy on his deck. Okay, so this, Looks like a banded sphinx moth. Um, the caterpillars feed on the primrose family, but it looks kind of newly emerged. I'm not sure if we could have lifted up the, the, the front wings. You may be able to see some color on the, mm -hmm. the hind wings, but yeah, one of the larger moths, sphinx moths. All right, your next one is Harlan, Iowa. She said it was there for a day, gone a little larger than a quarter. Yeah, so this is the elm sawfly. Most often we see the sawflies, they look like caterpillars, but they're damaging the elm. Um, and this is what it looks like as an adult. Um, it looks kind of like a fly, but it is a, a wasp. And we call these wood wasps. They are harmless. They don't sting people. They just lay their eggs on trees. Wow. All right. And finally, we have one from Lincoln. Found this on the siding of his house. He thought it was a tick because it was so little. Used to magnif magnify the picture. He said 5 16th of an inch and about three sixteenths wide. Yeah, so this is this is called the tarnished plant bug, and that's a really good picture. I don't, they are pretty small, but they're the most common plant bug in, I think probably in the US. Like they're, they're very common. They feed on like 385 different host plants. Um, they rarely do enough damage in the garden, but they are, they're not ticks and they're, they're pretty harmless. They overwinter as adults, but not indoors, um, often out in the leaf litter in the garden. Excellent. Thanks, Jody. All right, Rock. Um, this is a Deschler, Nebraska viewer. What kind of weed is this one? And it, she says it's very hardy. She's used various sprays. And, uh, and then we had a second one that also had the same thing, which is O'Neill. And oh, how do you control those wild things. So what do we have going on here? That first one is the most aggressive wild violet I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like the Rambo of wild violets. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. Because I mean, it's in the crack in the sidewalk. Certainly there's some soil mm -hmm. in there, but it's rooted down in there. And, and that is a really healthy wild violet. And that's mm -hmm. probably why uh, the viewer is having trouble controlling it mm -hmm. because it's just saying, yeah, come on, bring it. Kind of like Rambo, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a perfect timing. This is a perennial it, mm -hmm. it needs to be sprayed in the fall to be effectively controlled and probably two applications. We've, we're lucky with this, this warm spell, too bad it's dry, but this warm spell will be perfect. I would spray it. And she said she's tried some things. Look for a product that has triclopyr in it, T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R. That is um, really good on, on um, wild violets. So that's what I would consider my, as my first choice and two applications until it's really toasted. And even if you don't get 100% control, you might get it weak enough that it goes into the winter really, really um, weak and it doesn't survive. All right, and your uh, <coughs> second two pictures are Oto County viewer. Uh, weeds are coming up, she says, in her flower beds in masses. What is the best fall control and what is the best spring control? So, so the, the two pictures we looked at before we started were, were um, um, chickweed and henbit. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's another one that follows this one that 
Right. The, yeah. And these had to be, a, you know, I know chickweed is up now, but it's literally a less than an inch tall. Mm -hmm. um, so these must have been taken in the spring. Mm -hmm. And and then she, she had a picture of them to say, and, and they grew up and, and perhaps, because they normally die out in the summer months. These are winter annuals. Uh, right now, um, you know, they, they are going to, they're annuals. They're going to die, you know, once it gets really cold, but they are winter annuals. So they're not going to die. They're going to be like a herbaceous and die back to the ground and then come back. But I'm just shocked that they are this healthy this late in the season. So my guess is that maybe these pictures were taken early. Regardless, you can control them with pre-emergent herbicides like the preen type products um, work relatively well on this, but you have to put them down um, in the fall. So if they're really worried about it, you know, and, and it's in, in close proximity to other ornamentals, certainly um, any of the two, the broadleaf herbicides are not gonna be an effective way. So either have to shield the desirable plants um, or wait until they go dormant or, and then they can just spray over the top of them with, with anything. Because if they are truly that healthy going into the winter and they actually germinated earlier than is mm -hmm. normally anticipated. There's a lot going on with that, um, with that, those two pictures because they're both winter annuals and should not look that robust this time of year. I have chickweed that's like this already. Yeah, but those are like fully, they had, the, the chickweed had yeah. se seed heads on it. I, 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 I don't, you know, and the viewer didn't say, I don't think that when those pictures were taken and yeah. um, I'm hopeful that the, uh, otherwise they have some sort of weird mutant because those are both <laughs> winter annuals and they should not be, unless it's on the southern side of a house and it's really moist, there's a lot going on there. Well, it's I in an annual bed, so right. it may it be, be fertilized and watered, watered frequently and all that. And all that. So it yeah. could be. And if yeah. they haven't done any weed control in there because of the annuals, yeah. so you're right. Have you ever seen them this time? time no. Time? But. <laughs> no, I, that's, that's yeah. why I'm a little bit yeah. shocked. Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's like a, a, a horrible answer with, <laughs> with no results. So I don't know what to say. <laughs> We're going to move on. All right, Jeff. Why don't we move on? <laughs> <laughs> this is a Wahoo viewer, uh, and you're getting this because of the environment, even okay. if it might be insect related. It's milkweed, uh, west of Wahoo, very dry, lots of insects. This is second year growth on this plant. Mm -hmm. Leaves are discolored, red, yellowish, and brown, which is probably Jody, but it's pretty environmental too. She did not water very often. Yeah. So how is she gonna get butterfly milkweed to look better? Well, um, a couple things. I mean, the milkweed, sometimes you need to be patient with them. Mm -hmm. It takes two, three, maybe more. And you're right, I, you know, they uh, tolerate dry conditions, but with the mulch and what we've been through, uh, again, this would be one I would double check and make sure that, you mm -hmm. know, that mulch layer is really preventing any water in if they're not watering either. So it could be very, very dry there. So. Again, I think that would be my, my answer. And I see they've got goldenrod and some things. So I'm sure that's kind of their native bed and they're mm -hmm. trying not to mm -hmm. use resources on it. But I think that would be one that I would spend a little time on. All right, and then your next one, uh, this is an Omaha viewer. She says she's grown chamomile. She thought this was chamomile, but it's planted by the birds. Mm -hmm. uh, five feet tall, so aster, boltonia, what do we think this yeah, is? Yeah, I think you're right, I think boltonia, and, mm -hmm. and it's, I think it's on the fence line she mm -hmm. mentioned, and I wonder, you know, because it travels, if it came from the neighbor's yard, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a good plant, It's so there's nothing wrong with it, enjoy it, it gets big. I would even consider planting maybe some native grasses around it to help hold it up a little bit, mm -hmm. so it won't lay down quite so much, so right. little blue, something like that. Okay, all right, so I think we maybe have time for a question or two before we go to our next segment. So Jody, the first one that we have for you is somebody has found on milkweed little orange clusters of little orange insects okay. that are banded with black. What okay. would those be right those now? Those are called milkweed yeah. bugs. Uh, there's a large one and there's a small one. The, the large one has it as an adult has a black band that goes across the back and then the small milkweed bug has a heart on its back. Black. All right, excellent. I always get worried when you start doing this. <laughs> well, you know, it's a bug. It's, it's, it's an insect. We do need to take a short break. We'll be answering more of those gardening questions right after these messages. Right now, we have lightning. All right, Jeff, you ready? Yeah. This is a Brainerd viewer who has been using coffee grounds and eggshells in the garden for six years. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. <laughs> if they haven't had any problems, they're not growing coffee or chickens aren't coming up, then they're good. 
<laughs> then we have a Midtown Omaha viewer who grew watermelon, uh, only got a couple melons, but but they weren't sweet. What causes that? Well, it could be the heat and kind of inconsistent. If they only got two from that, then probably look at your how you're cultivating those and do a little research on that for next year. All right. A uh, viewer wants to know whether they should move a butterfly bush now or wait till spring. I would wait till spring. All yeah. right. Uh, we have another one who has multiple lilies. They sound like Asiatic and Oriental. Mm -hmm. Wants to cut them back, dig them, and thin them now. Is that a spring or a fall? Uh, I would do it in the spring. Okay. Um, we see bottoms of tomatoes still being sort of burned. What mm -hmm. is that? I don't know if it's inconsistent watering again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what I would look at. You know, and again, if you have, my tomato plants are doing pretty well at home, so I'm continuing to water them. If you want more tomatoes, they're still coming. So All they're right. not turning quite as quickly, but right. they're still ripening. All right, excellent, thanks. Okay, you ready? Sure. As long as it's not a winter annual question, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a viewer who moved to Carter Lake recently from the Pottawatomie side and encountered the sandy soil and is wondering, is zoysia, your very favorite, or buffalo grass better for that situation? So if they're going to try to plant on that sandier soil, I, the first thing I'd do is incorporate some organic matter and then just plant fescue or bluegrass. The zoysia or the uh, buffalo grass are going to struggle just like any grass will in sandy soils like that. All right. Uh, this is a Stella viewer who wants to know whether you should till before seeding. Um, if, you're, if the ground needs to be tilled, it's compacted on the surface, certainly. All right. Uh, we have a Minden viewer who wants to know whether he can use atrazine on a garden. No. <laughs> and we have a Northeast Dixon County viewer who needs to reseed a cemetery lawn that was damaged by moles. There's no water. What kind of turf? Then I would go with buffalo grass in that instance. All right. Does gypsum really break down clay soil? No. All right. Uh, we have an acknowledgement that uh, Roundup is the best idea for <laughs> zoysia from this viewer, but he does wonder whether he should bag it because of its tendency to produce thatch. Probably, but I'd hit it with Roundup three to five times. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Great job on yours. Yours were easy. His, he had yup and no answer. <laughs> this took forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jody, you ready? Sure. This is a Frontier, Frontier County viewer who has flies all over the outside walls of a building. They've used a spectricide home spray, but why are the flies doing that? Depends what kind of flies they are. If they're cluster flies, then they like to overwinter. If it's the sunny side of the home, they're trying to get up and in. All right. Um, which insects are most important to do your clean f uh, fall cleanup for so you can get rid of them? Are there one or two? It depends what you're growing. So if you're growing squash, the squash bugs and the squash vine borer. Okay. That, this answer can go on forever. I know, but that's a good one. <laughs> Uh, this is a Walnut Creek viewer who did see those little orange insects with two black spots, and you think that's the milkweed bug thing? Yeah, it's probably a milkweed bug. Okay. It's on milkweed. If it's not on milkweed, it, it was could on be milkweed. A... Okay, then it's a milkweed bug. All right. This is an Omaha viewer who wants to know how to keep stink bugs from overwintering. You got to seal up the gaps, and if you're going to spray, you need to. It's got to be about timing. So when they're going in, that's when you've got to get them. All right. And if they're in the garden, what do you do? <laughs> Who knows, right? They're just All right. there. Got two bricks. <laughs> They're just there, yeah. <laughs> nice answer. Go with that. All right, plants of the week, Jeff. Okay, well, we're kind of going with a Husker theme here with some red, so that's good. Getting ready for our first game. Mm -hmm. uh, so the perennial we see here is sweet hyssop. So it's a Southwest native. Loves hot, dry. Full sun, so which would kind of indicate any time I see that color, I'm typically thinking mm -hmm. in a hell strip out there by the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the mint family, and you don't have to worry about it spreading. And then the, the leaves and the berries here are from a T viburnum, so which is one of my favorite viburnums. Really a graceful viburnum, five feet tall, maybe mm -hmm. six feet tall. Um, a little particular about how you want to grow it, but um, it's uh, just a beautiful, beautiful shrub. Hard to find, mm -hmm. but it tolerates sun and shade, so it's, it's, um, it's a great plant. 
Yeah, and that's out of the, those are both out of the backyard farmer garden. Yeah. And that right. tea viburnum is always every single year people ask us what it is. Yeah. So, all right, thanks for that. Jody, uh, your next set of questions. The first here is a carny viewer out for a morning walk, found this little guy in the middle of the sidewalk, uh, either dead or really cold. <laughs> what is that? This is an American dagger uh, moth caterpillar. And so hopefully she didn't poke around too much because those spines can actually um, sting and cause a rash, but they're typically yellow fuzzy caterpillars with these little black, they call them lashes. And at the very back, they may have like a, a bunch of black lashes, but if you could have saw the head capsule, if it's black and shiny, then that's what it is. All right, then we had actually two different viewers send us pictures of this next one. One was Carney, said the lawn was covered with these, and the other one said, and the other was Minden, said she's noticed a lot of these eating the hydrangeas. What okay. are they? Well, these probably are uh, yellow woolly bears, and sometimes they look yellower or orange-er um, at other times, but they are, normally on plants that are really low to the ground. Um, they'll feed on pretty much anything, but they turn into Virginia, well, they're the Virginian tiger moths. So they turn into like white moths with a couple black spots. Um, I mean, they're pretty big. You could pick them up. They are, they are not going to sting you. So mm -hmm. they're pretty safe to handle. All right. Uh, then we have a viewer who sent us the picture of this tomato hornworm. What yeah, happened? Poor, poor thing. Um, so this is biocontrol at its best. Uh, this is a hornworm caterpillar that's a pest of tomatoes, and then the predator is a small little wasp. So if you actually keep this in a container, if, if that's what you want to do, you will see like hundreds of tiny, tiny little wasps emerge in a couple of days. Um, so this is a type of parasitoid wasp. So um, it's a type of braconid. It lays her eggs inside the caterpillar. The larvae feed on the non-vital organs and then crawl out. And then these are the cocoons that you're seeing. So mm -hmm. it's like the movie Alien, but real life and much better <laughs> circle of life. <laughs> and equally creepy. Yes. <laughs> All right, and then your fourth one here is, he thinks this uh, 3 16th inch long thing looks like a tailless scorpion with those little pincher things straight out. Yes, this is so cool. So, and it's cool that he said that because it is called a pseudoscorpion. Um, they are harmless. They don't have a stinger. They just have those little claws. They are really, really tiny. And you'll find them like on bark and under logs, rocks, outdoors. They just like high humidity. They feed on small little invertebrates, mites and eggs and stuff. So they're good and cute. <laughs> cute. All right, thanks, Jody. Okay, Rock, the first one here, uh, she found this grass growing in Omaha and wonders what that is. So that's elephant grass is its common name. It's a, a Rundo a Donax, I think is the species name. Um, it's native to India and uh, you know, the, it, it's invasive in 11 or 12 states, um, noxious in about nine or 10 and it, you know, if she wants to continue to propagate it, I mean, it hasn't been documented to be widespread in the state of Nebraska. Um, when I looked on the USDA map, it was like oh, Lincoln, Omaha, right? And mm -hmm. and, I, and it's sold as an ornamental. I mean, it can get 20, 25 feet tall. It's crazy big, as you can see in that picture. I, I look at those lower shrubs and they're probably six feet tall and that's clearly three times as tall at least. Mm -hmm. I, you know, they kind of have a showy miscanthus looking seed head on them. Um, but they could be pretty aggressive. They have rhizomes. Okay. All right, your next one is uh, an Omaha viewer that found this particular weed growing in the middle of an aster. Do we have any idea what this is? I, I, have, I looked at this before the show and I have no idea. I couldn't get close enough to really, I blew it up a little bit on my phone and I couldn't really see it and I'll, I'll let the two horticulturists or even Jody if she wants to chime in, um, say if they <laughs> can identify what this is because I have no idea what it is. I, it got me too. It's almost mint-like in its, the way its seeds are set, or is that mulberry weed? It's too big for mulberry weed, Jeff. Yeah, I don't disagree, and the leaves aren't right. It's mm -hmm. almost like a hoppy mm -hmm. uh, seed on it. Mm -hmm. Maybe if she still got it, she could send us a really close on it, mm -hmm. even, and we can answer it even by email. Well, now I feel better because two of the people I think know plants far better than I do couldn't get it either. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a weed. We don't pay any attention to weeds. All right. Pull them and put them in the bucket. Exactly. <laughs> Your next one is a Donovan viewer, which is also a can you identify this weed? Yeah, this is common mallow. Mm -hmm. um, Malva neglecta is the scientific name. But I love the name mallow because back in the day when it was first... Uh, you know, they used it for different things. It was, this is where the name marshmallow comes from. Mm -hmm. It was used in marshmallow production, which, you know, none of that is true anymore because obviously it doesn't produce whatever the mm -hmm. synthetic thing they stick into marshmallows. But mm -hmm. I wonder how it did in a marshmallow roast though. I never, s'mores. S'mores. Yeah. Not s'more. But that's com <laughs> common. If they want to control it, uh, most of the, uh, we, we, did they want to control it, Kim? Finish the question. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they want to control it. So it, it's relatively easy to control. They want to get it earlier than, um, than now because when it puts a seed head out on it, it's got a really hard capsule, and those hard capsules are impossible to control with a pre-emergent herbicide. So yeah, they need to, they, earlier would have been better, but um, they should control it right now and with any of the broadleaf herbicides or even glyphosate if the plants around them go dormant because it'll stay green a little bit longer than most of them. All right, thanks, Rock. Jeff, we're gonna go back and get one that I forgot. Okay. Which is a Council Bluffs viewer that planted wildflower seeds. Very few came up, but first was this one and loved it. They wonder, is this an annual or a perennial and, and mm -hmm. uh, when it's, to plant? Yeah, it's uh, Mexican sunflower, so it's an annual. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that possibly could reseed, although birds tend to like it. Uh, so if it's something that they do really like, especially maybe right now, if there's still some good seed heads, you might want to go out and bag those up and hold on to them for the winter and then take them out in the spring. Are those readily available? Those are kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah. are. It's in a lot of wildflower mixes, so mm -hmm. it's very common. Is it a native? Not here. No, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, your next one is a Lincoln viewer wonders why sweet potatoes split like this. Well, it could be a couple of reasons. One could be that uh, after the vine started browning, they kept it too wet mm. um, is one reason. And then um, maybe high nitrogen use, a little bit too much nitrogen as we went through the year. So uh, if they did fertilize, think about for potato production, especially root crops, I tend to go with compost instead of fertilizer. So that would help avoid that in the future. All right. Your next one looks like it belongs in rots and spots, which it does, but this is mulch and these little things are showing up and he wonders what these are. I know we talked about this before the show. So this is a bird's nest fungus. Mm -hmm. So very common, there's a lot of um, Rock's favorite slime molds and mulch, you know, the dog vomit, he loves that. But um, <laughs> so there's a lot of things as fresh mulch breaks down, you get a lot of these funguses. So this is just kind of fun. Fun little one. All right, your next one is also a Lincoln viewer. Uh, grew corn in the backyard, and it is actually a beautiful variety called mm. Glass Gem. But he had a lot of ears that look like this, which also <laughs> would belong in rots and spots. And he's wondering if it's pollination and something else. He used I've, fish fertilizer and added a soaker hose. Yeah, I don't know if the fish fertilizer is an issue. Um, you know, and I think they said it was their first time with corn. It may be a pollination, maybe not enough plants. It's tough in a small garden to get real mm -hmm. good, complete pollination. I think they overhead sprinkled, ran that mm -hmm. quite a bit. That would maybe be my thing, leaning towards that, so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the edible corn fungus there, is it? Or, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah. anyway, All right, so you thanks. can't eat it. <laughs> Pick off the kernels yeah, and don't right. eat the other stuff. Right. All right. Well, we have had another outstanding year in our garden despite that late start and this goofy, goofy weather. Our time lapse camera above the plot has captured the entire season. Let's take a few minutes to see how our garden grew.
You know, we really enjoy bringing you those updates from one of the most beautiful places in Lincoln. And of course, there is still a lot of time to visit if you're out for a walk. Please stay on the paths. All right, Jody. Last questions of the year for you. The first is um, he's got two-year-old Concord grapes. He thinks this is grape phylloxera. How does he control it? Yes, this is grape phylloxera. It's caused by an insect. Well, no, it's caused by mite. Um, no, that's not true. It is caused by an insect. So controlling it's going to be tough. It's usually not uh, effective. So the best thing to do is try to grow American root stems because they are resistant to grape phylloxera. So look for ones that are grafted on American. Right. All right, excellent. It's probably European root oh. stem. Okay, then we have um, in the country north of Weissert, Nebraska, which I've never heard of, um, hackberry tree branches. She said the leaves started doing this. They saw the growths among the leaves. The tree is over 100 years old. Wow. Um, no other hackberries close to it. She wonders whether this will actually kill the tree and um, is there anything they can do to stop the spread? Um, well, they can prune this out. This is hackberry witch's broom and it might have occurred a while ago, but it this is from a mite or um, powdery mildew and it's just a deformity of the, of the tree and the, the leaves there. So it shouldn't kill the tree, just prune out what you can. Right, and it is a big tree, so if they can't prune right. it, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Rock, your next one is, uh, we had a, a viewer send in a question that says, the acid from pine needles will ruin the soil. They think this is untrue. What is the truth? And this is actually, obviously, pine needles under pines on turf, so. So obviously the pine needles are acidic, but in terms of actually altering the soils in eastern and even central and western Nebraska, it, do, it doesn't really do that readily because we have highly buffered soils. But it does smother because they, mm -hmm. they're so tightly bound. It makes a pretty good mulch if you can keep it aerated. Uh, and, and, you know, so people think that under pine trees that it's allelopathic. Yeah, no, it's, it's not really the acidification of the needles. Right at that layer, it'll be acid, but it's really not that detrimental. It's just that it smothers things. Mm -hmm. All right. And your next one is a um, reseeded question. Reseeded only a week ago, used a fescue mix, covered it with this straw mat. This is between sidewalk and curb. They wonder, was it too late to seed or will the mat protect the new seedlings? And then will that netting break down? This is a Fremont viewer. Okay, so the, it's probably not too late because we're gonna have some warming trends and the soil temps are still in the low 60s. Um, it's going to take some really hard, cold weather to drop that down, so I think they're probably fine. Will, they will get some insulation from the straw. The straw will break down. That doesn't look like a biodegradable netting to me, so mm -hmm. I would suggest you remove that when the seed, you know, you're primarily doing that to keep the mulch down because it, so it doesn't blow away. As soon as the seed comes up, before it starts, you know, it'll start pushing up on that, um, that mesh screen, pull the screen off because it's a great trip hazard. And if you've got any children or people walking across that area, um, they can, it can trip you up. The heel of a shoe or whatever can catch on that. And it's, you know, they use that to net sod and often that's a problem when the sod wears down from traffic. So yeah, I would remove that after the seed comes up and pops through it. It may be next spring, but I would definitely try to remove that and try not to pull up a bunch of grass when you do it. The straw will break down, so it's fine. They did a great job, by the way, fantastic. All right, excellent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jeff, this is an Alliance viewer. Unproductive blackberry bushes and acreage. They bought them five years ago at a farm supply store. They've spread nicely. Mm -hmm. They pruned back the first time, first time last February, and they only had a handful of berries. They water by automatic irrigation. Mm -hmm. What what do we think here? You know, really, what I read didn't. Um, I felt like they're doing a lot of things right. Um, you know, I would watch the irrigation, make sure we're not over irrigating. Uh, I know they're in alliance and so it's a little drier there, so they might be able to get away with a daily irrigation. Uh, pruning everything back, you know, so you're only gonna wanna prune off the canes that have produced fruit. So, you know, taking everything to the ground means you've set you back another right. year. So kind of wait and see. I'd be curious to see this coming spring and summer. I bet you'll start seeing some better production, but again, Focus on just taking those flora canes off the ones that have produced fruit and leave the others until they've fruited and kind of get into that cycle. All right, and your final question is a Fremont viewer that has uh, honey crisp apples mm -hmm. that uh, obviously are diseased. Yeah. So what are we gonna do here? You know, and honey crisp is one that's not highly resistant. 
Um, right. So, um, and I think I, I, they did a spray, and, and as our uh, rots and spots folks will tell you, you need to start that very early in the spring uh, and continue that on for several, several weeks. Um, it's really kind of tough at this stage. Um, you know, yeah. give a good mulch, make sure you've, you're taking care of all the cultivating parts and, and hope for the best. Well, and again, as you say, Honeycrisp is absolutely one of the worst. The mm. ones you get in the stores are, mm. are uh, pretty much treated with many things yeah, to not look right. like that. So yeah. yeah, try something else or. I think so, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. I think you'd be happier to look for one that's resistant. Right, exactly. Well, and unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Backyard Farmer tonight. Thanks to our audience for all those questions you submitted this year. Also to our panelists for another great year of garden fun. We'd also like to thank our NET partners for their dedication, the hard work it takes to put this show on. Thank you so much for watching us this year. As we close out the season, we did make a special video to say goodbye. We hope to see you all next year as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. was really a challenging year for Backyard Farmer. We didn't know that we were even going to be able to have a show. We had a show, but we only had three panelists. And lo and behold, we actually got to extend our season well into October, which has really never happened before. couldn't have a phone panel, but that didn't stop you from asking all those great questions, sending those pictures either through email or Facebook, making sure that we could give you the information you needed to be able to either garden for the first time or to be able to solve all the issues you have in your own landscape. Mother Nature did what Mother Nature does. It rained, it didn't snow, but we had a lot of wind, then we had drought. Our annuals grew like topsy. Some of our perennials and our trees and shrubs really went into desperate straits. We tried to answer all those questions for you because that is what we do best. Make sure that you are ready to watch the winter show. We'll be back with everything ready to go for 2021. And good night, good gardening. We'll see you all next year right here on Backyard Farmer. Mm -hmm.